This is a continuation of the Golden Eagles. If you have not already viewed part one, please do so before proceeding. A modern day woman was quoted as saying, women didn't even drive cars back then, much less fly airplanes. Amelia Earhart is one of the best known female aviators. She is known for a number of quotes. She said, everyone has oceans to fly if they have the heart to do it. Is it reckless? Maybe, but what do dreams know of boundaries? This is the eight cent airmail stamp issued 25 years after she disappeared. Amelia is pictured here with her flight instructor as she began flying lessons in 1921. She was the 16th woman to earn her pilot's license. Amelia set the women's altitude record of 14,000 feet before Charles Lindbergh made his first solo flight. She nicknamed her small yellow biplane the Canary. This art craft first day of issue cover with a plate block of four lists some of her accomplishments. I don't usually read from the screen, but not knowing how big your viewing screen is, she was the first woman to fly the Atlantic and the first to fly the Atlantic solo. The first woman to fly nonstop across the United States. The first woman to fly from Hawaii to the United States. The first woman to be honored with a dis distinguished flying cross. Another first day of issue cover, her airmail stamp tied to the 50th anniversary of Lindbergh's solo flight. A silk cover by Colorano. The image is printed on silk and then attached to the cover. She formed the Women's Aviator Group, the 99s, an organization for the advancement of female pilots. She became the first president of the group, which still exists today and represents flyers from 44 countries. Here's a first day of issue cover from the classic American aircraft sheet of 20. It features the Lockheed Vega, she named Friendship, in which she made the transatlantic solo flight. She's pictured here after landing in Ireland following the transatlantic flight, almost exactly five years after Lindbergh's solo flight. A remark by my best friend and artist Chet Lawson. I didn't realize I had put the plate block into a mislabeled glassine envelope with a large dollar amount on the envelope. He didn't know you could buy the stamp today for a dollar and forty cents. Artists are already nervous about making mistake before they start painting. After the project was over, my friend said, never again. Another Chet Lawson remark. These little paintings turn nice collectibles into one-of-a-kind pieces. This is a first day of issue cover with a cachet by C. Stephen Anderson. Another hand-painted cover, but why this particular date? This was the 50th anniversary of Amelia's first crossing of the Atlantic as a passenger with Wilbur Stutz four years before her solo flight. How did Cheyenne, Wyoming get the Earhart station cancellation? She made a stop in a gyroplane while flying cross country in 1931. Looking at the back of the C-10 stamp booklet, Cheyenne was on the original airmail route across the United States. It was also part of the Transcontinental Railroad route since 1869. Early airmail pilots often used railroad tracks 
also known as the Iron Compass, to navigate. Today, Interstate 80 passes through Cheyenne. Another absolute favorite of my collection. The autographed cover features C-12, which pictures a pilot's wing insignia, and the globe in honor of their bravery and spirit of adventure. Well received by the public, this universal symbol of flight was used on airmail stamps for the remainder of the decade. This photograph shows her with the Lockheed Electra shortly before departing on the round-the-world flight attempt. I think we found the photo that provided the model for the stamp. Up to 10,000 of these covers were planned for the flight. The covers were pre-addressed. She was to add stamps and acquire postmarks along the route. She did receive postmarks before takeoff in Oakland, California, and again in Pakistan, but no one knows exactly how many covers may have been lost. This map shows the route taken on the planned around the world trip in 1937. Here are some of the newspaper headlines the day after her plane vanished. An extensive search effort never returned any results. The United States spent four million dollars searching. In today's dollars that would be about 72 million. She was pronounced dead in 1939. So what really happened to Amelia Earhart and her navigator Fred Noonan? There are a number of theories about the disappearance. Mr. Elgin Long spent 35 years working on the crash and sink theory. The analysis of all the data we have, the fuel analysis, the radio calls, other things, tells me she went off into the water off Howard Island. The wreckage would have been under 17,000 feet of water. Dr. Robert Ballard, the same man who discovered the wreckage of the Titanic, could not find any evidence of the plane. Speculation was that Fred Noonan was pictured on the left, Amelia in the center with her back turned, and the wreckage of the plane on the right at the back of the ship. All the theories about Japanese capture have been disproven. This photo was proven to be from a 1935 tourist brochure two years before the flight. Gardner Island, south of the Howard Island destination, is the most likely crash site. Gardner Island is the Americanized pronunciation for Nikumararo Island. Here is a part of the landing gear from an earlier Earhart crash in Hawaii, very similar to the one found on Gardner Island. This map shows the location of the landing gear and the bones found on Gardner Island. We have news from November 2019 of the bones being sent for DNA testing to be compared to Amelia Earhart's niece. The DNA test of the bones could possibly provide the final answer to the mystery. Here's another what happened thought. There are four Lindbergh stamps and one Earhart stamp. Why? Their accomplishments were very similar. Why only one Earhart stamp? Remember what Tom Hanks said while portraying James Lovell in the movie Apollo 13? Christopher Columbus and Charles Lindbergh and Neil Armstrong. 
In my humble opinion, Charles Lindbergh's accomplishment ranks up there as one of the bravest explorations of all time. Let's take a look at some comparisons. The two aviators were similar in a number of ways. They were the first man and the first woman to accomplish the solo flight. Charles was the first recipient, and Amelia was the first woman to receive the award. They were both best-selling authors. Charles Lindbergh for We About the Solo Flight, Amelia Earhart for Last Flight, published by her husband, Charles Putnam. They both took astronomical risk for tremendous rewards. One last thought for today. Let's compare and contrast. Pilots are capable of taking off, landing, and maintaining level flight. Aviators love to fly and are capable of flying instinctively, that is, thinking outside the box. All aviators are pilots, but not all pilots are aviators. Stamp collectors accumulate stamps. Philatelists seek to understand beyond the stamp itself. Not all stamp collectors are philatelists, and not all philatelists are stamp collectors. However, one person can be both. A special note of thanks to my best friend and wife, Sue Turner, for teaching me the presentation style I used in today's presentation. Stan Cromlish for introducing me to video conferencing and giving me my start with stamp chat presentations in his weekly meetings. And to Heidi Rhodes for putting me at ease and building my confidence during the rehearsal of this presentation. In review, today we took a look at my version of A Concise History of Charles Lindbergh, A Thumbnail History of Amelia Earhart, Some Examples of My Airmail Stamps and Covers, and a review of the parallel traits of the two aviators. Again, it has been a privilege and an honor to present this information to you today. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions or comments, please be sure to leave them in the space below. If you enjoyed the presentation, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to receive notifications of future shows.